Welcome back to the Hank Strange Situation, Lifestyles of the Locked and Loaded. Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts. This is episode 680 of the Who Moved My Freedom podcast. I'm your host, Hank Strange. Um, tonight, the uh, title of this is um, Rat Snakes. We've got author... And uh, retired ATF agent Vincent A. Sheffaloo joining us. Vincent, welcome to the show. How are you, sir? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm great. I couldn't wait. I've been looking forward to this. Absolutely. Same here. Uh, I've been looking forward to it myself. I have been listening to the book, and I'll just tell everyone. Here, let me throw up the book here for a second so you guys can see. This is the book, Rat Snakes, Vincent A. Sheffaloo. We're going to get into that. Uh, that's the proper pronunciation, I believe. Um, it's available. You can get it from Amazon, um, lots of different places out there, as well as Audible. I've been listening to it on Audible, and I am about like halfway through. Very uh, interesting, uh, very candid look, I think, behind the scenes at the ATF when it comes to the undercover investigators. Believe it or not, that's what uh, Vincent uh, was for how many years, Vincent? 27. 27 years. So joining us, my friend, there he goes, Babyface P, in the house, joining us here. <laughs> What's up? So so you had to live a double life for 27 years, basically? Yeah, pretty much. Wow. But yeah. a whole bunch of double lives. Okay, and so you it know, wasn't just there, one, there, it was... There's a whole bunch of different scenarios, and... Um, you know, I went out every day, maybe being somebody else. Oh, wow. Yeah. So this, uh, listen, I really, I, I'm telling you guys this. I, first of all, I enjoy having authors come on, people who've lived a life, and then they mm -hmm. come on to tell us about that life. It's, it's awesome to me. It's one of the things I aspire to be. At some point here, I will write about this whole YouTube experience, and everyone's going to get exposed <laughs> in my book. <laughs> But, uh, no, not really. I like fictional stuff. But um, I really do enjoy talking to folks out there, and we will allow you guys to answer, uh, ask us questions and things like that. Patrick, uh, when you look at Vincent, like if you walked into a bar or you were walking down the street, and Vincent, <laughs> don't take this the wrong way, this is what this is what gave you your undercover chops, I believe. You you don't what, what look would you like think? the you don't look like the suit wearing ATF agent that I picture <laughs> no, no. in my mind when I think of like going to to ATF headquarters. <laughs> uh, I had a suit. Well, I had two suits. <laughs> so you had court, two, one, two. Okay. One for church. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you. So is that like, you know, I'm going to get into to the background of who you are and everything. But was that a massive part of your job? Because like, I, I'm trying to say, like, I don't mean this as an offense, but you look like a criminal. Well, that that was part of the job. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. that was like step one. Right. But looks looks won't get you very far. Um, mm -hmm. no, no gangsters can right. see yeah. right out that. So you got to have some game. Yeah. I mean, um, if, I, if I was in Hollywood, I would book you so fast. Yeah. I'd <laughs> like that. You could be up, Hollywood. <laughs> you could definitely. Right, am I am I wrong in this, Patrick? No, no. You could. You could. I mean, you lit. He lived the part, Hank. He, of yeah. course, he could do it. Central <laughs> casting. It was. I mean, so so. Getting into some of your your roles, how dangerous did they get? Could you, if you didn't live the part perfectly, could you have wound up dead somewhere? Good question. Well. If you lived it perfectly, I would hope the answer would be no. Mm -hmm. um, but you never know going in what perfectly is. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they go left, you go right, and it works out good. Or they go left, and you go right, and they're like, wait a minute. What what do you say? What, why are you doing this? Why, are, why can't I get your... Home number. Why Talk to the lapel cam, please. Yeah, just, just, just right into the microphone. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. Wearing a wire. Yeah. So uh, let's let's um, for sure, like right off the right off the back, I could say, if I was, and I'm not, I'm like a sweet angel. I have never like even jaywalked in my life. I'm just saying. Yeah. Me too. Yeah, if there's any other, <laughs> if there's any, if like the ATF or anyone, any other government 
alphabet agencies are listening. Pure, sweet, innocent angel over here. But, you know, let's say I was a criminal and I was looking to do a deal. I would probably look at Vincent and go, oh, yeah, this guy is definitely. He can't. He, there's no way. No, no way <laughs> well, he could be you know, the, the popo. You know it's, it's freaking. Did you just call me a hobo? No, I said popo, popo. Oh, okay. <laughs> popo, not the hobo. <laughs> no, the reason I said that is somebody called me a hobo once. Uh, that, that, no, that's disrespectful. <laughs> You know, this is what made me comfortable. Mm -hmm. Looking like this, acting the way I act, you know, what what put me in role where I felt comfortable. But I literally, there's a story in the book where one of our guys went and did a meth and a gun deal, and he was dressed like Lord Fauntleroy. Mm -hmm. He had a $300 uh, uh, raincoat, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, London Fog? Fog yeah, London Fog type thing. And he had a hot hat. <laughs> like a fedora right. and slacks and shiny shoes and he walked in and he played it like a pro bought the dope bought the guns mm -hmm. in out it was and i was like in awe because mm -hmm. i was like you mean i really don't have to look like a vagrant to do it <laughs> yeah well, but that's what worked for him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes know? yeah i think that's the thing but look let's do this let's start off because i think that your background will probably, in some places, be surprising to folks. So let's just go back a little bit. Like, tell us, you know, uh, where were you born? What kind of family were you born into? How were you as a kid? I was middle class as could be. Um, I was born in Marin County, California, um, just outside San Francisco. And uh, I was a single, single kid, you know. My mm -hmm. parents didn't have any more kids. My dad was a bartender. My mom was a nurse. And uh, it was pretty good and standard for most of my life. And then, you know, um, they got divorced. And so it was just me and my mom. And when she had to go to work, I felt like I had better to do. And mm -hmm. I did it. Didn't good. work out so well. Yeah, so you were kind of like a bad kid from from uh, listening to the I audio book. You were a bad kid growing up. Okay. I, from 11 years old to 17 years old in state institutions wow. in and out but mostly in right yeah that's that so that was the interesting part because i think in the beginning of the book you would talk about uh escaping from juvie <laughs> yeah kind of proud of that in a really twisted and demented way right. but yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, you know, I don't know. See, like, to me, it's not super surprising because I remember growing up as a kid, my cousins, they were, they were the biggest bad boys. Like, the most gangster cousins I had when I was in high school became police officers. Really? No kidding. Yeah. <laughs> so, it's, I'm not saying that always happens, right? There's a lot of police officers or law enforcement people who are very by the book and all that kind of stuff their whole no, life. No, but there's, there's, there's a certain draw um guys who like the edgy life um mm -hmm. like a little adrenaline and what have you mm -hmm. you know it came down to me i can be a crook for the rest of my life and get that adrenaline or clean my act up mm -hmm. and do what i always wanted to do since i was a little kid and be a cop and get the same adrenaline but not looking over my shoulder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, do it with a badge. Yeah, well, I had a little. I had a little help from a judge in Marin County, but okay. So basically, I think so. That part of it is at some point. Did you say that was when you were like seventeen? The the judge gave you an uh, like an ultimatum. Yep. Okay. Um, and uh, it was uh, a reckless driving, uh, racing. Mm -hmm kind of thing but mm -hmm. I had been in there so many times and I was of age he could give me like legitimate jail time and he was just over my mm -hmm. and he gave me one last chance the part I didn't put in the book was that I was like oh what am I gonna do what am I gonna do so I ran down to the Air Force recruiter mm -hmm. thinking I'd get a nice skate you know oh. do my <laughs> little Air Force time and everything. Right. And they did my criminal history, background check and everything, and they went. Because they were winding down from Vietnam. We were just getting out of the Vietnam War. Oh, okay. So they, they weren't hurting for people. Mm. And uh, okay. 
the Air Force looked at my background and they went, ah, sorry, dude. Nothing yeah. we can do for you. So right. I was walking out of the recruiting station. The Marine Corps recruiter was leaning up against his door and he was like, hey, kid. <laughs> okay. A true story. Mm -hmm. And I knew I had to do something or I was going to jail. So I talked to the Marine Corps recruiter and the rest was history, baby. So wait, so that's interesting. Okay, so the judge gave you an ultimatum like uh, spend, go to your, to, uh, like. Come back in 30 days mm -hmm. and you'll either be uh, enlisted in the U.S. military. Okay. For four years, or I bring your suitcase because you can do a year in jail. Do do a year. So, you try to do the Air Force. So I'm guessing like the Air Force is kind of the easy. Like if you had to choose one of the military things, Air Force well, is easy. Well, I know easy. Air Force people won't like to hear that. But. No, well, there's they still work, mm -hmm. up, but mm -hmm. easier in right. terms of military regimen compared mm -hmm. to the Marine Corps. Right. And, uh, but they weren't having none of it. My clock was ticking, so hmm. I raised my right hand and I was gone in two weeks. Oh wow! Okay, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> good choice. Okay, so how long did you spend in the Marines? Six years. Oh, okay. oh wow! Okay, yeah. six years active duty. I did four. Okay, I married my childhood sweetheart, oh. and we were doing good. I made rank, and I started college. Mm -hmm. But I had gotten about two years into my college. So I said, if I can re-enlist for two more years or extend, it wasn't really mm -hmm. re-enlistment, it was an extension of my original contract mm -hmm. to the six years, um, I might be able to finish my college. Mm -hmm. And so I shipped over for two more years, went to Camp Lejeune as a military policeman and uh, still didn't finish my college. So it wow. was time to forget. Either I was going to make <laughs> a career out of it or finish my college on the outside. Okay, so you became an MP. Right, I was a military policeman. Okay, interesting, interesting. By the way, actually, mm -hmm. um, another story I don't think was in the book. Mm -hmm. When I was at Camp Lejeune, we were just standing up the fast teams, the, the anti-terrorist teams. Okay. And so we were training, we had a budget to train state and local law enforcement. So they'd come to Camp Lejeune, we trained their SWAT teams, to put it simply. Mm -hmm. Well, the Athens Police Department, Athens, Georgia, came up, went through, and we were talking and drinking beer and doing all the things you do during mm -hmm. training. And they went, so you're about to get out? I said, yeah, dude, I'm about 90 days short. Um, I need to find a job because I'm, and my ex-wife was from Georgia. Mm -hmm. So it's like the stars aligned. And they went, dude, we'll get you hired in Athens, man, because um, we had been training together. So I got out, and within 90 days, Athens hired me. Okay, and Athens hired you as what? As a police officer. As a police officer, okay. Anybody in the police department. Hmm, interesting. And this and was I what, the 80s? College. Was this? I, I was always looking at the feds. I crossed okay. paths with a bunch of feds, FBI, DEA, Secret Service. And when those guys walked in the room, it was like, what? To a local cop. Right. You know, I went, oh. I want to be one of them. And so that's where I set my sights, and the rest is history. Okay. So, okay, so uh, I'm trying to, so this was the 80s, right? When you. Right. Okay, so you went into law enforcement first. So you, you got a degree also. Right. Okay. I finally got my degree while I was in Athens Police Department mm -hmm. and then started applying to all the federal agencies. Well, the U.S. Customs Service. It was during the big, the cocaine wars and the big buildup in South Florida. Mm -hmm. All the boats and the blimps and the airplanes and helicopters. And yeah, Miami flooded. Vice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it was. It was mm -hmm. Miami Vice days. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I took that job. It was the first one, first fed job that I was offered. But then I ran, after about a year and a half, I ran into some ATF agents on a really big case. We were working at Customs. And I went, oh, those guys... Those guys rock. Okay. Like we had twenty we had twenty agents on this big smuggling case and they sent two guys. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. So that <laughs> So they, they were like superstars. <laughs> yeah. 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 They came riding in on white horses and did with two guys what we were doing with twenty. Oh wow, okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you kind of like the edge of that. Like that's probably I like did. the Marines, right? That's probably a like the Marines do that too, right? That there's usually less Marines than any other. Uh, you know, I, I often compared, and mm-hmm. I still compare my days in the ATF. I'm not vouching for anything craziness going on now, but mm-hmm. my days in the ATF were very much like in, being in the Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. Small, elite, under the radar. And when we were in Treasury, man, we killed it. We kicked. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think there's a couple of things here. By the way, let me before I forget this, a friend uh, Dave from Down the Barrel says Air Force has the best food. I think I think he was in the uh, Army. I agree. But, no, uh, well, the name I used to chase prisoners over to Pearl Harbor, mm-hmm. and uh, that was the first time in the military, my whole military career, I walked into a mess hall, and they went, "How would you like your eggs, sir?" <laughs> and I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So you did, so you, you've got a degree. What's your degree in? My bachelor's is in criminal justice. Okay. So you have more than a bachelor's? I have a master's in forensic psychology. Okay. So you got a master's. Okay. See, uh, this is why you shouldn't judge people. <laughs> All right? This is what... Oh, dude. And I love it. I love <laughs> love it when i get called asked to come out as a keynote or something mm-hmm. <laughs> people look at you people weird yeah. me and they make those judgments yeah. same as the bad guys yeah. you know they make assumptions based on what they see right here and right now yeah i could see you go into like a high school or a college and the kids don't know and they're trying to get something from you you know like you see let's, let's see if we can get some weed off this guy or something <laughs> before before you come on there and also to me this is like a, a good you know if you need a clearer example of the what the american dream is than this i don't know because you know here's someone who grew up like as a kid you you're a bad kid you're getting into trouble all the time you know you're in juvie and all this kind of stuff and you were able to turn your life around and serve as a marine get a get a, up to a master's degree right and have this uh like what i'm going to assume is a full career in, Dude, in it, was, it was the textbook American dream, but I've got to say this, and there's not enough time in this mm. podcast to, to tell everybody, so I'll just give you a generic. I had a lot of people behind me. Mm-hmm. The juvenile justice system backed my play. The counselors, the, you know, the uh, guards, the the social workers, the you know, the people at Hannah Boys Center, mm-hmm. um, they never gave up on me. So mm-hmm. it wasn't like I did all this by myself and I just lifted myself up. I had, my parents were behind me, you know, the whole time. They never gave up mm-hmm. on me. So I had a lot of uh, motivation to get it right. I just, it, you know, the stars aligned because I can tell you about a third of my friends I grew up with are dead. The other third are either have AIDS or in prison, mm-hmm. and that's 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 no exaggeration. Yeah. So I was yeah. blessed. Yeah, I mean that particular to this particular. You're still here. You're still kicking. Who knows what goes from here? Maybe you be you know you start acting or something like that. Movies. Or get maybe made the New York this. Times bestseller. Hey, you know it's all good. It can happen. <laughs> Make sure to check out HankStrange.com. You can sign up for our email list and find ways to follow and support our efforts.